Good morning, afternoon or evening, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Victoria Moores. I'm European Bureau Chief for Air Transport World. And with me today is the Chief Executive of the Airlines Association of Southern Africa, Chris Kasragenthal. Good morning, Chris. Good morning, Victoria. Great to join you. Thank you. Chris, uh, you just had your annual General Assembly yesterday and like a lot of associations and businesses at the moment, you've had to do that meeting online because of the COVID crisis. Uh, your members are specifically Southern African airline members, so that goes beyond South Africa into countries like Namibia, etc. So I'm curious to know, just in terms of the overall situation that you're seeing among your members at the moment, how have they been affected by COVID? Thank you, Victoria. Yes, uh, certainly the members have been affected. If in, even if you take pre-COVID-19, there were a lot of um, problem areas and challenges that the airlines in Southern Africa were we're um, experiencing. We had probably only a number of mostly privately owned airlines that were in a profitable situation and the others were sort of either in, in close to break even or in a negative situation. And obviously COVID-19 um, impacted everybody com completely. Um, at even pre-COVID-19, we had South African Airways and SA Express going into business rescue. And following COVID-19, one of the most successful airlines in South Africa, Comair, Went, went into voluntary business rescue and they're still in that situation at this moment in time. If we go along the region, I don't think there's probably an airline now in South Africa or Southern Africa that will make a profit during this uh, financial year, given the fact that uh, from uh, the end of March, um, all states effectively introduced a lockdown on uh, mostly on domestic travel, although some, air, some states did continue to have domestic travel, but definitely on international travel. And so from that perspective, it introduced a liquidity crisis because there was no revenue coming in. And then you had a situation where they had to look at, at severely curtailing costs because cash was king. And so we had a situation where um, certain costs, uh, particularly on the uh, fixed cost side, which is around about up to 40% of, of an airline's expenditure, which had to be continually uh, funded. You had a situation where probably in the, in the main, uh, the employers, employees um, were suffered significantly and obviously many had to be put on unpaid leave or paid leave. Uh, there was retrenchments that took place or even layoffs that took place. So very, very poor situation and a really uh, a tough situation, which is going to lead probably to a situation where around the region, we're going to have a loss of around about a billion US dollars for this year compared to probably what was um, project what happened last year which was about a 200 million us dollar loss so not a good situation and hence the the importance of getting recovery started and getting getting aviation going not only on the domestic which is pretty much on the run now in in most of africa but regionally and internationally as well mm -hmm. and in terms of the restrictions that you're seeing across your specific area at the moment how many countries are still limited in terms of international flights and how many are now allowing that and opening up? I think it, around the, the, uh, the, the area, uh, around the region, most are opening up to, um, to, to international and regional travel. From a South African perspective, they're completely opened up to Africa. So no, no state in Africa is restricted from flying into South Africa or to bring any passengers to South Africa. So that's pretty good. I think one of the biggest issues at the moment for us is to try and get harmonization of the measures that the states are actually implementing into, to allow um, travelers to come into South Africa and around the region. Uh, some areas there, there, used, there have been some requirements for quarantining and then others just requiring uh, COVID-19 PCR tests uh, to be negative before you're allowed into, into the country. I think there's definitely also some other positive moves that are starting to happen where they're talking about the antigen tests that are coming in and being implemented in certain in certain states so that if you do not have a test that's positive uh, a, a negative test and uh, available to to show the authorities when you arrive in, in in South Africa for example they're looking at now introducing antigen tests which are, are tests requiring about 15 minutes before you will know the result whether it's positive or negative and so that's very good if you arrive here and you are in a in a um you are COVID, you're found to be COVID positive, then you will unfortunately have to go into quarantine. But I think what we're, we're certainly supporting the global view that quarantining is not the way to go because it, it is absolute 100% deterrent on travel. Um, if you look at uh, tourists, 
traveling around the world and going in for visiting various, various uh, uh, states. The normal average stays around about 10 to 12 days. And if you're required to do a 14 day uh, quarantine on arrival in a country, then there's absolutely no uh, incentive for you to travel to that particular country and you'll wait for the quarantine to stop. And you mentioned about sort of uniform responses. Obviously, this is more a situation for health ministers at the moment. That's very much a national decision. Have you seen any uniformity for aviation coming from a body like AFPAC, which tends to oversee aviation within the region, or has it been very much state by state? No, I think um, certainly from ICAO and AFCAC and AFRA and IATA and ourselves as ASA, we are united in supporting the civil aviation, International Civil Aviation Recovery Task Force work that was done. So the CART, as they call it, has been implemented, which really advocates for harmonized um, regulations between states and to ensure that there are no um, sort of um, different type of regulations that are implemented to, to, to probably give, a, give travelers a problem in terms of trying to make sure that if they're going to visit a specific state, they have to make sure that they comply with certain regulations and not others. So the problem, of course, is that, that many states are, in notwithstanding the CART, um, the CART uh, guidelines, are actually introducing their own individual um, restrictions. And that is causing problems for, for passengers and, 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 and making passengers think twice before they actually make the decision to travel. And I'm just thinking, well, maybe I'll just delay my trip a further three months, four months, five months, six months. Um, we, I think we, as, as aviation, the work that's been done through ICAO and World Health Organization and all the, the work that's been done by the individual civil aviation authorities to put guidelines in place whereby protocols and standard operating procedures have been put in place has fantastic. And we are really saying that um, the passengers in terms of all these protocols that we must comply with, and as you know, we're a very regulated industry, so compliance is an issue. If we, put, if we operate and according to those uh, protocols, it's absolutely, it's safe to fly. It's going to be a new experience to fly, as we've, those of who have flown will know, because of obviously wearing masks on board and going through the various sanitization and um, uh, social distancing measures within an airport. But once you're on board the aircraft with a fantastic uh, and probably the best air reticulation system in the world on board an aircraft, if, you, if we behave ourselves, we sit there, it's absolutely safe to fly. So we're encouraging governments to say, look at all these fantastic measures you've put in place and you've approved. There's no need for additional restrictions to make the, the lives, uh, it make it difficult for travelers to move around between countries. And obviously from an economic perspective, it's absolutely essential that uh, we get aviation, travel and tourism going to the fullest extent so that we can help the economic recovery. Because around the world, we're seeing that at risk is around about 50 to 51% of the economic contribution of aviation to the economy is at risk and we obviously need to reverse that trend. Mm. And you mentioned about the significance, the importance of aviation to Africa and to overall economies. Uh, earlier on we were talking about South Africa and the situation there seems to have been quite severe in comparison with other African countries. I mean, perhaps that's a reflection of how established the aviation industry is in South Africa versus some of the other countries that you have so many airlines, but we've seen a lot of them going into business rescue, which is roughly the South African equivalent of administration. Do you think something specific has been going on in South Africa that hasn't been going on in other countries? Um, are, you, are you referring to specifically to why we've got such a high infection rate or something like um, that? To, I think to why we're seeing so many airlines immediately, even like Comair, which is a very strong airline, go into business rescue uh, where we've not necessarily seen that yet in other countries? Well, I think uh, in the other countries, you probably have got state-owned airlines. And so therefore they're uh, obviously in close contact with the shareholder, which is the state. And they're probably finding ways to, to prop them up and, and to assist them with some cash or loans, et cetera. On the Kame side, as an example, um, they are a privately owned airline. And obviously they, they're only their shareholders, which are private shareholders, have, or have the ability to fund the airline at this moment in time. We, we as, as ARSA did apply and, and make requests to the government for financial relief for all airlines in, in South, South Africa, um, both public and private. And unfortunately, we haven't necessarily got that response as yet. I think there's still some discussions ongoing, 
but so the problem with with Kame was as as they as they as they published at the time was to to go into voluntary business rescue to restructure the airline and obviously to protect themselves from creditors which we can understand and and um, and and on that basis then restructure and it looks like um it looks like they, the the shareholders and the creditors have approved a, a business rescue plan and i think the funding and the investment side is being dealt with at the moment and we're hoping to see them fly probably before the end of the year but on the case of, of South African Airways and SA Express, that actually happened before business rescue. And we're still in that situation of trying to resolve their business rescue situation, which is also a matter that has been in the media space as well quite a lot. Mm -hmm. We've already seen that business rescue plan come forward for SAA. It seems to be a real issue of funding at the moment. And then also um, in terms of SAA um, Express, then there's this bid from the employees so i mean what's your sense around all that do you think we will see these airlines up and running again yeah, it's a difficult question to ask me i i, I would you know I'm, obviously my interest is the sustainability of the industry in southern africa and um we've come from a situation of a of a of a of a going off, almost off a precipice where we got everybody down to zero overnight effectively by the end of march and so really starting from scratch now, we've only seen four airlines start operating in South Africa, um, such as Seme, Airlink, Mango Airlines, and Fly Safe. Uh, the, the, the other th three airlines are not operational at the moment. And, and, and obviously it would, be, it would be great to see an, an industry back to normal, but I don't think uh, everybody talks about a new normal and I'm not sure how that will pan out. But until such time as, as um, government and the, um, the, the board and, and the shareholder of, of those two airlines um, address their, their issues and particularly re revolving around funding. I, I think we just need to wait and see how that will pan out. Mm -hmm. Now, are there any other airlines that are, I mean, I know that everybody is in financial difficulties right now because you can't not fly and then end up not in financial difficulties from the vast majority of airlines. But are there any other cases of concern across the continent at the moment where they may not fly again? I, I am not aware of that. And, and, and the interesting aspect is now that we've, we've been going through a, um, a situation where we went to zero and then now we're starting to ramp up and we're going, very, we're going quite slowly. Um, so I think every airline is probably in, in, in difficulty. The importance is to, to get the, the markets open and get flying again so that you can actually generate the revenue and start paying off a lot of the debt that you've got. If we have a slow um, a slow recovery, slower than, than even what's been projected at this moment in time, you could see airlines getting into financial difficulty. And that's basically because they will not be able to fund their debt or, or, to, or, or to finance their debt. Um, they may have taken on loans now, but there's always, when you take on loans, you've got to repay those loans and probably with interest as well. And if, you are, if you're not able to fund that, um, that debt at some point, you, um, and, the, and when, the, when the debt starts to become due, then you could land up in problems. And so I think this year, you probably won't see many casualties, but when the, when the uh, rubber hits the road and you have to start paying back some of that debt, maybe in 2021, we could start seeing some, some trouble. I just hope, as I say, that's why we are so um, passionate about pushing to reopen the markets that we don't put airlines into a position that it's an irrecoverable problem of, of, of not being able to come back and start operating in a sustainable fashion. Yeah, and absolutely, it's as we go down the line that we're going to continue to feel the impact of this. Um, Africa as a continent um, tended to be, from, from what we're seeing here, one of the last to be hit by COVID in, in a very strong way. Obviously, we saw it originating in Asia, moving very strongly into Europe, moving into the US. Comparatively, how do you think Africa has been impacted compared with the other regions and also what's the view for Africa in terms of the recovery we've heard a lot of numbers in terms of the global recovery but what's about Africa I think Africa's done remarkably well when we didn't and 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 one of the reasons when if you remember the lockdown when you looked at the flight radar 24 for example you could see still lots of flying over the USA Europe and and Asia and yet in Africa, we had hardly anything going on. Uh, there were only some domestic flying in some of the states around, but certainly no international or, or intra-African flights other than cargo flights and essential services flights. So I think the lockdown 
uh, was very hard on Africa. And I think that's one of the reasons why many of the travel tourism and aviation companies are in such difficulty because there was no other source of revenue other than the cargo revenue. But now that we've got that situation, I think the recovery has been remarkably good. We went through the peak and particularly in Africa and South Africa, as you mentioned, was probably more than half of the, the rest of Africa combined. But we went through that situation and every community was exposed to the to the to the to the to the virus and on that basis we you you got a situation where the the risk of a second wave is probably not there uh, and we hope it doesn't obviously occur um, so I think we've done remarkably well and I think that's why it's it's the basis on which South Africa has for example said all African states can fly to South Africa they're really looking at some of the other um, international states we don't understand all the the, the high risk list that they that South Africa has put together and we're asking obviously questions to try and understand how we got that list and what we can do to get people off the get states off the list but um, I think in general it's been a very good um, a response and Africa hopefully is in a position to to take its uh, take its lead and get going and, and intra African travel has started and we need to find ways to actually ramp up that that travel thank you. And my final question, and it's actually moving away from COVID, and it's what about the topics that are being um, sort of overshadowed by COVID at the moment, like the single African air transport market in the background of all of this, while all of the states are being rallying to, to address the pandemic? Has everything stopped in terms of uh, African air transport liberalisation or are things still being moving forward? I think uh, the the focus when COVID hit us was very much on surviving COVID. Um, as you start to get to a question of restarting and particularly intra-Africa, SATAM, I think, will start to get focus again. And in fact, I've certainly seen the moves from AFCAC and from the African Union to re-energize that process um, of getting SATAM going again. I think a little bit of work is going to have to start again because you're going to have to assess where some of the countries that were ready to implement SATAM are with regards to their own aviation market. Because it's all well and good to go for SATAM, but SATAM does require commitment from states and obviously needs the support of the airlines to do that. And there's obviously a lot of liberalization and, and much more freer flow of traffic. But again, it comes back to the problem of, of Africa saying, I need to make sure that my, my state is ready for this because um, I, may not have an, I may not have an aviation market. So how do, I, how, do I do, how do I do this? How do I commit to Saturn and give away rights when I would like to make sure that my airline is back on track so that it also can compete in that market and, and obviously provide a service? So yes, I think Saturn will start to get energy again and impetus. And, and, we'll, and that's one of the reasons why we committed to participate in the process to ensure that we, we, we make sure everybody's ready for, for SATAM and to get going and make sure that there's good reciprocity between states, um, that it, it happens. And um, obviously, I think it's 33 states at the moment that have committed. We just have to, I think we probably have to go through the process of making sure that those 33 are still committed and see if we can't get more on board. And then obviously the process of implementation of SATIM, which is now, which was a process which was starting to really get in, um, momentum before COVID, we'll have to restart that. So it's been a bit, of, I think it's been a hiatus a bit, unfortunately, and then we'll see how we go from there on. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, because once... Once we get past this particular crisis, Africa still has that issue of connectivity that needs to be addressed. Well, Without a doubt. Thank you so much for joining me this morning, Chris. Uh, this is Victoria Moores reporting for Air Transport World.